Hey, it's Mark Kinsley with the Dos Marcos Podcast, and we are living in extraordinary times. I think we all know that. It's scary for a lot of people. There's uncertainty about how this is all going to shake out for the world and for our industry. But one thing I do know is through it all, you want to have great partners. You want to have great partnerships. You want to have true friendships. You want to have people you can count on. And that's why we have a partnership with Pure Care. And we form that partnership with Pure Care because we have shared values and because of the way they treat their retail partners. Although when we come out on the other side of this, the world may look very different. We're still going to need great partnerships. And I would definitely urge you to, if you have downtime, if you're looking for how to reshape your business, if you're rethinking your future and you're using this time to plan, check them out at purecare.com and holler at us if we can answer any questions. Dos Marcos Podcast. It's the greatest mattress industry podcast on the planet. Wait, isn't this the only mattress industry podcast? He's Mark Kensley. I truly felt bad for you at the time. He's Mark Quinn. I think Bigfoot was actually very pleasant. Together, they are Dos Marcos. The real question here, Jen, is what is your reaction to Tiger King? Oh my gosh. I binge watched this. I binge watched the whole thing over the weekend. See, I knew, I knew that we had a winner on this. By the way, real quick before you answer everyone, this is Jen Danko with nationwide. She is the VP of, uh, let me get your title, right? VP of technology for site on time. And she's awesome. You guys are going to have a blast. We're going to talk about all things digital, but way, way more important than that is how inspired are you? Do you have a crush on the tiger King? We want to hear it all. Yeah, I, I w- so when I first started watching it, I was like, I, I mean, there's no way I'm going to be able to sit through this this whole thing. And then it, as it got more and more into it, I'm like, I can't turn this stupid show off. I'm so mad. Um, but yeah, fascinating. It, almost like I was trying to explain it to someone. And I was like, it's almost y- you can't believe it's real. Like, it's so dramatic that it's it's it has to be a fake. It's crazy. Uh, we thought it would be a really fun way to start the show because. It's not really a question these days for most people of have you seen it. It's a question of what was the most shocking. And then once you start going down that laundry list of items, you're like, okay, this is a this is a guy that has a sweet dyed mullet. He's a polygamist. Mm -hmm. He's he's an owner of like more than 100 tigers. He's a country music star. He has a, a real active <laughs> ongoing feud with somebody in a different state that also owns tigers. I'm like, this is made for TV wait, gold. Wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. You forgot political uh, right. activist yeah. and potential true. governor of the great state of Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Did, did you, so did you guys watch the whole thing? Yeah. The whole thing. You, did, did it end the way you thought it was going to? I thought he was going to get mauled by one of his cats actually yep. and um and uh, the hey you crazy cats and kittens lady what was her name yeah carol baskin <laughs> baskin, carol baskin. baskin. Yeah. i thought she was going to be at the end like uh you know pouring gas on top of his grave and lighting it on fire how did you think it was going to end i thought it was going to end that there was going to be a twist that they were going <laughs> to figure out that she did kill her husband and and uh i really thought that's that was going to be the end of it and that he was like as crazy as he was, he was right all along um, about it. But no. and it may still end up that way. We don't know. So Kinsley, how about you? Like, what what inspired you? What offended you? Like, what were your thoughts? I cracked up because I told my friend about the show, and he, no, he texted me and he said, "Have you watched Tiger King?" And I said, "I just got done finishing the whole thing." He apparently stays up late that night. I wake up to a text, and there were four of them in a row. And one text said, that lady's missing her arm. <laughs> the next text says, I literally had to go take a shower. I felt so dirty watching this. So here, here's the here is the uh, spoiler moment. Probably too late to give that. But if you haven't seen Tiger King, we don't want to ruin this 
classic piece of art that <laughs> is a Netflix special. So <laughs> you might scrub forward. Yeah. And uh, you know, we wouldn't run anything for you, but uh, yeah. Well, would you have? Thought- I- he was a yeah he was a gubernatorial candidate and he got like 19 percent of the vote I, right <laughs> hey don't forget jesse the body ventura was the governor of minnesota right yeah. a, a professional wrestler trump himself is a reality television star happens to be a billionaire right so anything can happen we like our politicians to be characters many times mm. and in this case he definitely fit the bill he did i mean this Perfect. guy and, and and this guy you know we're we're kind of talking about marketing stuff today and like what people can do during this time when they're hunkered down. Was this guy a marketing genius? Yeah, for sure. He for sure was. He knew, he knew all the buttons to push. He knew a lot of them were, as a matter of fact, in the, in the series, all of the different um, characters for each of the different, um, I guess, animal or zoos or whatever, whatever it was they were, they all knew um, you know, you saw a lot of them, how sexy the tigers are, even if they're cubs. And it was crazy the the ideas that they came up with. So, so, you know, what was crazy for me is, so you go from the tiger King and then you go to this other guy who also has a cat compound and yeah. a zoo. He yeah. comes riding in on an elephant. Yeah. Right. He's also a polygamist. Exactly. Yep. Like he was almost keeping women prisoner. Yeah. Like that lady that, like told her story that like lived with him. Yeah. And then she like broke free of that and the way they paid them. And it was like, what, what is it about tigers and big cats that makes you want to have multiple wives? I don't understand it. Maybe. Yeah. And uh, even, even Carol's um, rescue, the number of volunteers, the number of people that are, have, are devoting their lives to this and, you know, trying to move up in the ranks. It's crazy. Okay. Last question for both of you. Okay. If you, if you lost your arm because a tiger chewed it off, would you go back to work in five days? I would. <laughs> I would. Yeah. Hey, Jen. Who says? Savage. Who says I ever left work? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you and I were working there, I would just go pick it up out of the cage, and I would be like play fetch with this cat with your arm. Because, like, I have to say, one of my favorite moments out of the entire series was. The polygamist that lived on on the East Coast that had his tiger kingdom that like basically enslaved women. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy had like you know really long, you know blonde ponytail as well. Another requirement to be involved in the tiger world: long blonde hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, they were interviewing him about all the crazy stuff that Mr. Tiger King. Um, where did his name end up being? What did his name end up being? Joe Exotic is what he went by. But I, what was his? I couldn't say his real last name. By the end of it, it was like Joe Passage something, something, something. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because changing his name. So, okay, we'll go, we'll go with Joe Exotic. So, Bhagavan, whatever his name was, crazy tiger guy with all the wives, um, <laughs> they were interviewing him, and he, he just got so jovial and amped up whenever he said, oh, my gosh, the best thing he's ever done is hire a lookalike of Carol Baskin to feed parts of her dead husband to the, <laughs> to the tiger for his music video. He was so excited about that. <laughs> Oh, I, I love the fact that he had his own web show and there was like seven people that watched it, but he did it every single night. <laughs> committed to those seven people. I'm telling Anyways. you, it's just too bizarre to be real, but it was. That's what was so addicting about it. He was the content king and he was the tiger king. Yeah, yeah. for sure. We better bail out of here, guys. Yeah. We <laughs> the tiger well, king. let's talk. Let's talk about. Let's talk about content. Let's talk about digital marketing. Let's talk about the conditions people are in right now because. You know, that that was a version of crazy that was unfolding uh, somewhere deep inside Oklahoma and out in the, the rest of the world. There's an, another version of crazy that's unfolding, and it's the coronavirus and it's impacting retailers, it's imp- impacting suppliers and manufacturers and people all over the world in, in businesses and industries that we can't even see. Uh, but we want to take this time, obviously, to help people think about time is an asset we do have right now. We can use it. And how can we use that time productively? Uh, not only to serve people kind of in the interim and, and get your your business and your online health elevated, um, even while your your business health may be suffering, but what can we do to 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 use this time? And Jen, you you work with nationwide members every day to help them figure out the digital landscape. Tell us, just give us the state of the state, like define reality for us right now from what you're hearing from members. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the reality is that many of our members stores have closed or they're practicing um, best practices based on CDC um, and, you know, distance, social distancing, even within their stores with their employees, all of these things. And so it's been amazing to see our retailers just sort of jump into action and find more creative ways to be um, to keep their doors open in a lot of ways, even if their physical doors aren't open, to stay connected with their customers, make sure their employees are being taken care of. Um, you know, it's it's fascinating to think of these retail salespeople who've been on the floor sometimes for, you know, 20 years or more selling, and now they're trying to figure out how to sell from home. Um, you know, large, high consideration purchases um, online. So it's it's been amazing to see people jump in and really take a look at their website, their digital presence, and figure out you know, how do we change strategies? I've said for so long, one of my favorite things about our independent retailers is that they are so nimble. You know, they can turn on a dime um, and change the direction of their business. And many of them have. Um, and so rather than panic, they've just really jumped into action um, to figure out how do they do business in this environment. It's amazing. So Jen, we've talked to some prior to the call about like what are the things that retailers like what's the self-exam they can be giving themselves right now and i think you came up with some really important things here so uh the first thing you were talking about was um i thought was was really interesting to me was the chat function like yeah. it's a simple thing right mm -hmm. and so a lot of people have websites and aren't there plugins in most cases where they can find and even WordPress sites and plug in a chat function. And that gives people the ability, like a lot of people don't necessarily want to call and talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. So the chat function makes it easy, right, for people to correspond. So talk about that a little bit and um, maybe uh, outline a little bit of, of how easy it might be for people right now without that to actually integrate that into what they do today. Yeah, it's probably one of the easiest things you could integrate into your website, one of the easiest changes, because it really involves no business rules, no no logic, no coding. It's just this little small snippet of code that you copy and paste to whoever your website provider is, and they just drop it right into the site. So it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's so simple. Um, it's such a powerful tool. And, and the truth is, it's been powerful for long before this all happened, but even more so now that the best Part, one of the best parts actually about about digital um, media and digital presence is just that you can meet customers wherever they're at, right? So they don't have to come into your physical store. They can shop your store without ever walking through the front door. Um, you can connect with them on Facebook through chat, um, obviously through normal, normal channels like phone calls. But a lot of times people, um, you know, they might be at work or it might be late at night, whatever the case may be, or after hours, and they can't always pick up a phone or they don't want to. Some people just don't like to communicate by phone um, these days. So, you know, it's just one more avenue that you can connect with them. And the truth is, many of these people who communicate on chat are comfortable with communicating in chat. In other words, they do that on other, other websites, multiple um, media opportunities, there are media channels there. And so you, each of our retailers giving them that option on their website is just one more way they can communicate with them as well. Um, and it's so simple. And I think before this all happened, we had retailers who had integrated chat and the idea was, well, it's gonna end up being a whole bunch of customer service issues, right? They're gonna tie up my salespeople with, with delivery problems or que delivery questions or c creating a service call, something like that. But that's not true. These are very qualified leads that are coming in. They're just people that choose to communicate through chat first um, versus picking up a phone call. Sometimes people feel like they're going to be pressured by a salesperson too. So they feel like it's like a simple way for them to get in and, and they're kind of in control. They don't have to hang up on them, but they can, you know, sort of end the conversation if it gets, um, if they feel like it gets too salesy. Um, or they're feeling pressured. Um, but what we find in our retailers that have been doing chat for a long time is the close rates in chat are usually around 60 or 70%. So they're very high. These are people who genuinely are looking for products, just have a question, just wanna know availability. The top three questions we see on chat are, do you have it, how much is it, and when can I get it? Right, those are what people wanna know. And they feel like that's those are simple enough questions that they can just type that in without having to make a phone call. So hit us again. Do you have it? What was the second one? Um, how much is it? And when can I get it? Jen, I don't know if you have any insights or maybe even some data about this, but I, I think about other industries. And I have some friends that are that own a business in the home healthcare space. 
And they have a system and a process set up so that they answer every call and respond to every web inquiry almost in real time. Mm -hmm. Because when somebody's thinking about where they're going to put mom or what they're going to do with her because she's facing some sort of health issue, when they pick up that phone or chat with somebody, it's because they're taking care of that problem right now. And I think the same thing applies to furniture and mattresses and appliances. When somebody's thinking about that, that's the space they're in at this moment. So the first respondent often wins. Does that seem to flow? That's always the case. Even if it's whether it's live chat, whether it's a product inquiry or a contact form submission on the website, really whoever answers that question first ultimately ends up with the sale. The days where consumers can shop two or three stores and you know at, at least physically walk into two or three stores and find out who has the best price and they don't that doesn't exist anymore people don't have time for that they just want to know who has it essentially what's your price are you competitive in the market um and and do you have it and a lot of times i think retailers think well if i don't have it i'm going to lose the sale it's not true most people are open to trying a different product if you have it in stock especially if it's a duress purchase they just want to know you have something that they can choose from if they pick you. Um, so whoever answers first in in a consumer's mind has the best customer service, right? That's the first indicator. Um, and that's another that's another thing about the live chat too that we've talked about long before this is it can't be your receptionist answering the chat calls. It can't be the warehouse manager who doesn't know anything about products. It has to be one of your knowledgeable salespeople because this is their first impression of your store. So okay. we don't want it to be the this receptionist who says, oh, I don't know um, if we have that in stock or not. That needs to be someone who says, we don't, but let me find something for you. So Jen, on that note, um, chat bots are big, mm-hmm. right? So you see a lot of those on sites. Can you give us your feel like what you just said is it needs to be someone knowledgeable, which Kinsley and I'm sure would both totally agree with that. Yeah. But um, so are you a fan of chatbots? Is there a place for chatbots? So it, number one, define what a chatbot is for everybody and then yeah. tell us your opinion about using those. Yeah, so a chatbot has, um, is, is something that's been programmed to answer sp- very specific questions, to key in on specific keywords and then try to find a response to that particular question. So they're more automated. They don't require human interaction per se. Um, I am a fan of them. I do think they have a place. But I think it's in our particular industry, it's a combination, right? So it could be used to help um, identify some of those customer service related questions that are, aren't sales or help direct a customer coming in through chat to the right department, essentially, based on what their question is. So but it's a filter, in other words. I'm sorry? So it's kind of a filter. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it works great as a filter. I envision in the future that it's going to have a big place in terms of um, appliance repair or electronics repair to help identify what the issue is and then get it further down the line so that they can repair it faster. Um, but in terms of the sales process, specifically around appliances, there's so many different factors and there's so many different things that we need to do to qualify the customer and determine what is it that they need, what is the best product for them, that I think once they get to that point, it really needs to have some human interaction. So you might have somebody that hops online and if they engage with a chat bot, they could potentially get filtered down to the mattress space, for example, and that's able to ping the right person who has the most knowledge about the mattress category. Exactly. Gotcha. Yep. That's exactly right. Yep. Or well, if they that's... offer remodeling or design services, things like that. Um, what are some that's... of the more advanced? I think we got cut off a little bit there. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, what, what are some of the more advanced, um, sophisticated retailers doing with, with chat and the way that that potentially ties to a customer service dashboard, things of that nature. Can you take us a little deeper into it? Yeah, I think um, so. And there's there's actually a lot of different creative ways that our retailers are are integrating chat into their business, and they're doing it a number of different ways. So some of them have um, dedicated chat people. That's all they do is answer questions online on chat. Um, and then we have some retailers that have uh, identified people at physical stores to answer chat. So they will help a customer on the floor, but they'll take a chat session when it comes in as well. And then recently, because of 
um, COVID and, and the pandemic and everything going on, they're starting to integrate video into that as well. So they can actually show people products since they can't come into the store. Um, and that's another option is to using Zoom. Some chat providers have video um, as an option. Um, but the other one that's innovated that I really like is the ability to convert the chat to a text message. So you can text um, back and forth with a customer versus just through the chat. The reason that's important and kind of next level is because the chat, once it closes, the conversation is essentially over, right? So they'd have to come back and log in. But if you've started a text message with them, then they may end the conversation and say, okay, I've done that. And then an hour later, they may go, hey, I thought of something else. Oh, hey, by the way. And it becomes sort of this ongoing conversation because they now have a direct contact through you through text messaging. So it, there's kind of a pro and con there in the sense that some people aren't as comfortable giving out their, their cell phone number or texting like that because then they feel like you have a kind of connection with them. But in the same sense, the, the pro is that they like it because they can keep the conversation going and not feel obligated to keep the chat going, essentially. What a great insight there. I mean, I think that really is next level. So whenever a customer does engage with chat or the website, in some way, how do they get to the text piece of it? Is that something that originates on the website and you're able to transfer that over into a, to a salesperson's like cell phone, for example? Um, or I guess it will be a cell phone. Yeah, it's, it, it does go to a cell phone. It depends on the provider. There are um, There's chat providers that have a, a texting option, which means the customer can choose live chat or text. And then there are chat um, platforms or programs that are specifically text messages. So the entire engagement happens over text. So when they initiate that first um, connection, it's actually going to a cell phone and then they're responding via text message after that. So Jane, can you tell us like maybe for people that don't have a chat function, like mm -hmm. how they might go about integrating one? So step one would be what? So the first step is to identify the one that you want to work with. Um, and at Nationwide, we've got three or four that we will recommend for customers um, or for clients. And typically it's based on what they're planning to do with it and how many users they'll need to, to be logged in at any given time, because most of them are on a license basis per license. So the number of salespeople that will be logged in at any time determines the charges for that. Um, and then, or if they want to do text messaging. So we've got three or four that we recommend on an ongoing basis and we continue to, to research those and find more for them. Um, but once they did, all they have to do is sign up. They'll in the, it, every one of them will walk you through it. And at the end, it'll tell you, here's your code, copy and paste this to your website provider. And that's all they have to do. So, um, Jen, I don't know, Kinsley, did we at the beginning here? So Jen is a VP of technology, actually started site on time, but Nationwide purchased you guys. Mm -hmm. So now you are completely committed to the members at Nationwide. So if you're a Nationwide member, you have full access to Jen and her team, which is pretty awesome. Um, and if not, um, reach out and uh, talk to someone at Nationwide about it, because I know, Kinsley, you and I have talked many times about one of our favorite benefits of being a Nationwide member is what you guys do. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of independent retailers, it's it's a complicated thing to, to jump into the web, um, understand the commerce side of the web, and how to integrate it into what they do. So I know that you guys make it super easy. I was working, I opened up a new retailer in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, so great American home store, mm -hmm. and fantastic people. And you guys built their site, and they loved you guys. They really were happy with what you did. So uh, I know there's a lot of raving fans out there what you guys are up to. So Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about e-commerce, Jen. Let's, let's go into that to the puzzle right now, because I think it's a huge opportunity right now for people who are set up to sell online and distribute mm -hmm. those products efficiently. Uh, for people who didn't get there in time during this lockdown essentially of, of the world, mm -hmm. they're probably thinking, gosh, I, I really need to invest in making sure that I'm ready in case something does happen again, or, or maybe they're able to flip the switch now and get, get up and running so they can serve customers. Let's talk mm -hmm. about e-commerce and take us into um, some of what you do and some of what you do in terms of working with members and what they can be thinking about right now. Yeah, I, um, my recommendation if they haven't flipped that switch yet is to do that. And it's not too late by any stretch of the imagination. Um, at Site on Time, all of our sites are built 
um, e-commerce enabled essentially. And so it's really just turning a switch on um, to say, yes, this the cart is now active. Um, there's some setup and some business rules that have to be defined in terms of the retailer, um, but it's not a huge process. And, and RWS um, or WebFrance has the same option in their sites as well to turn them on for e-commerce. The reason it's important, um, obviously we know why it's important now, right? Because people can't come into the store. They're still gonna need to buy appliances and furniture and bedding. Um, things are still gonna break and they're gonna have to replace them. So people might be stuck in their home and thinking redecorating is a good idea um, right now and they're not, they know they can't come in the store. Previously before this, what was fascinating about e-commerce sales is these were typically incremental sales. So these were people who, for whatever reason, have decided they're going to buy them online, the product, whatever it is. They've identified it. Maybe they came into the store, picked it out. It's 10 o'clock at night and they're ready to purchase it. Um, maybe for whatever reason, they've done enough research online that they're confident that they're making the right decision. They're looking for the retailer they're going to buy it from. So if our retailers don't have their cart turned on, they've taken themselves out of the market for that sale, right? So if they have their cart turned on, then this is someone who they may have never connected with them previously, and they have an opportunity now to sell them something without ever meeting them face to face. But now this is just the way people are transacting. So if they haven't had it before, now is the time to turn that on and start thinking of ways that they can make it easier for people to shop with them and give them more opportunities than just coming into the store. So it's kind of found business in many ways. It is. Right? So based on what you were saying. so. What percentage, if 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 uh, we had a Dos Marcos furniture and mattress appliance store with the home theater and home connectivity um, aspect to it all, right? Is that everything? Do we get everything in our yeah. store? <laughs> um, and we sell grills too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in that store, if we didn't have an e-commerce um, part of the website, like what could we expect? Like what kind of ad could we expect? Is there a rule of thumb to that? Could it end up being 5% of the total volume we're doing, 10%? Like, what would you tell people on that front? Yeah, um, so it, there's a lot of factors that play in, like how much are they advertising it? How much are they showing inventory online? Are they, In other words, are they doing all of the things that help the site to convert? Um, so people can determine if they're making the right choice or not. Um, but quite honestly, it could be five, six, seven percent of total business if they're doing everything they can. If they're really devoting time to the website to determine um, what do people need to see on here in order to put that item in their cart and feel confident to check out online. And those things include showing inventory on your website. Um, you know, Sherman's in, in Peoria, Illinois offers next day delivery up till 10 o'clock at night. So for customers who put something that's part of their next day delivery um, products in their cart before 10 o'clock, they can get it the next day. So as a consumer, these are all things that help me determine, okay, I need this product. No one else is going to get it to me that quick. So this is this is a great opportunity for me to get this product when I need it. So is there like for the people who aren't doing e-commerce, is there a first step for them? Like um, it might be a little intimidating, right? So like what would you recommend for people? So step one is, and I think nationwide does some really cool stuff where you have a library of mm -hmm. a lot of the nationwide suppliers. So you have the marketing assets, you have photography, yep. you have some video, you have product descriptions, you have SKUs. So it's really, you guys can make it so um, nice and it's like a big easy button they can press. So talk a little bit about like how to get into that and, and maybe some of the hurdles that might exist. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. The truth is the website itself really is turnkey. So we can turn this on. We just need to know from them what their business rules are. And the best way to determine that and to identify that without getting overwhelmed is just think about um, what would the what would the customer experience be if I were to walk in the front door of a retailer's store? So um, they would help me find products. They would help me um, identify and qualify the products that be best fit my lifestyle, my house, my decor, whatever it is. Um, they'd be able to tell me if they have the product in stock or if not, how long it gets going to take to get it. Um, they'd be able to tell me what it was going to cost for delivery. Um, to get it to, to me. Um, it may be based on zip code. It might just be, you know, a flat fee, whatever that is. Um, but these are all the things that the customer needs to know as well. So really just trying to figure out um, or outline what are your business rules around each of the sales that happen and making sure that the website provider um, knows what those rules are so that we can recreate that experience. We want to make sure that, like I said, even though the stores are closed, when they're not closed, um, and a customer walks in, if they found the product they wanted, 
um, but decided I'm not sh really sure I want to get it. Could I could I check out at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and get the exact same experience? Would the price be the same? Delivery be the same? Could I get warranties if I want it, if I need a warranty or product production? Could I get, you know, the appropriate range cords or water filters or whatever it is? Uh, ultimately, I want to have the same experience. So the website itself is all ready to do this for you. We just need the retailer to outline what it looks like in their store. How, how many people out there don't have that part? to their website, Jen, like I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you thinking that, well, I'm sure most people are doing that, but they're probably not, are they? Have you done some research inside of your membership? Like, is it half the people uh, in, in the membership that have e-commerce abilities? Like what, what, what is the reality of that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's quite half. Um, I, in, I believe once this is all over, it'll be closer to 60 to 70% that have a website that will have that turned on. Um, but right now, I don't have the exact numbers. My guess would be somewhere around 30 to 35 percent have actually turned on their shopping cart, um, mostly just because of, you know, up until now, it's been time, just like we were talking about earlier with chat. People felt like, well, I just don't have the time or, the, or I can't pull a sales resource off the floor. I don't have the time to outline all the business rules for e-commerce. But now people have the time to do that. They see the value in it and how we don't expect something like this to come up. But now if they had had this turned on before, they would have been more prepared for it. Not that it's too late, um, but they would have had all these details ironed out. When you start thinking about the business rules and what goes into outlining that process, um, is there a good starting point for people or is there a worksheet for that? How might people go about navigating those rules and creating that document or, or some sort of process there? Yeah, um, we do actually do have a worksheet for them that helps them to outline what do they charge for delivery? Are there any exceptions to that? Um, is it different by product category or like I said, zip code? Um, so we've tried to make it condense it and make it as simple as possible for them to fill it in um, without being overwhelming. Let's, uh, let's zoom out and talk a little bit about uh, search. Let's talk about the way that people go about finding products because if they're sitting at home right now and they've got their house under the magnifying glass because they see anything and everything that's going on and they come up with an idea for something they want to buy, uh, let's, let's call it a grill. Like they want to make a nice outdoor space. They're spending more time cooking at home. The house smells like a meat mansion and they want to get some of the smell outside of the house. So we're going to get a grill. Yeah. Um, Whenever that happens, that moment happens, people are probably going to go online and type in something related to a grill. Yep. Local retailers, are they showing up? How are they showing up? How is the algorithm prioritizing products that could be on a retailer's site and mapping it to a local search? Take us into some of that. Yeah, so this is such a great question because before this happened, and, and nothing has really changed except for now, um, we've sort of shifted the strategies a little bit. Before all this happened, um, we we always told retailers there's really two very distinct strategies in terms of digital um, a digital strategy um, for pay per click specifically, but even SEO too, and that is that in store visit versus an e commerce transaction. So these are two different types of mindsets, and they're two different types of customer behavior. And when we're bidding on specific keywords um, or we're outlining a strategy we determine which one of these are we actually going to target. And obviously, if they didn't have their shopping cart turned on, then we weren't really bidding on that customer who was more likely to purchase online. We were looking for that customer who was more likely to walk into a store. And those types of search terms are where to buy this near me, where which retailer closest to me has this in stock, things like that, right? Like that search tells us that this person is looking for a store um, to go to or at least a local retailer. Then now we're looking more at those consumers who are buying things like, where can I buy this online? Who has this for quick delivery? Things like that. These are all things usually that indicate that someone is confident they've made their decision and they want to purchase something online. The best part about this strategy is, um, and, and what we're doing is a lot of retailers are turning on their shopping cart, which they haven't had before. Well, one of our highest converting online strategies is Google Shopping. And so this is when you type in a model number or a specific product. And over on the right side, it shows you pictures of the product, the price, um, and where you can buy it, essentially. 
Well, you can't advertise there if you don't have a live shopping cart. So Google requires that the customer ha should has to be able to put it in a cart and complete the transaction entirely online. Um, so as our retailers turn on their shopping carts, they can now bid on keywords and products specifically in in that section of, of Google. And that's important because this has typically been where larger box stores and national retail chains have advertised because you do have to push the products out that you sell about once a day to Google. So they know which products are still active, what the price is, um, and they do crawl for that information. So for example, if we don't update Google Shopping quick enough and the price has changed, then they'll send us back a disapproval notice to say, hey, when the customer added this to the cart, the price was a different price. Um, so they are monitoring that information. But these are people who are specifically looking online for products, and it's a great way for our retailers to be top of mind, along with all of the box stores in the national chain. So hold on. I, want to, I want to know real quickly, who is actually in charge of making sure that those daily updates are pushed to Google? Is that the retailer? That's the website provider. Um, so we have a feed of all of the products that are on their website and the price and whether it's active. And we push that feed to Google um, usually once a day, sometimes two or three times a day. But isn't that automated, Jen? Mm -hmm. It's a completely automated process. So essentially you can advertise every single product that's on your website. And when a customer searches for that product, your your store is gonna show up in those results. And if they're not doing those updates, Google doesn't like that and they'll ding them in the algorithm, won't they? They'll get pushed to the bottom if they're not good actors there. They'll actually get turned off entirely. They'll okay. turn it off if they feel like you're not keeping the information up to date um, with whatever it is on the website and the current price. So the idea is one that the consumer, it's a its a good experience for the customer because Google can confirm that this is real time information, it's accurate. And the other part of that is Google's trying to prevent any kind of bait and switch tactics from happening. So you advertise it lower, but they click on it when they get there's a higher price. So they're trying to make sure it's a very consistent and accurate experience for the customer. It's interesting to kind of go back to what you were originally talking about, which is this idea of search intent. And based on some of those strategies that you're deploying, you're able to more accurately target people that you think are going to come into the store versus people you think that are going to purchase online. Um, let's talk about those customers that you think are going to come into the store. Like, are, are they using terms like near me and things like that? And what are some of the strategies that you're deploying in the digital space to really capture that foot traffic? Yeah, that's exactly right. So they are using those terms like near me. Um, on most devices, uh, we're able to geo track or geo um, target where they're at. So we can say, if a customer is within a certain mile radius of the store, we're gonna actually bid higher. So what we do is as they get closer to the store and they're searching these terms, we're bidding more to be the first place that they see. Um, as they get further away, we might bid a little bit less, but it's still someone who is typing in where to buy this near me is looking for a physical location to come buy it from, right? So we're willing to spend a little bit more knowing that this person is obviously in the market. Because the, the great thing about, especially appliances and even electronics, like nobody for the heck of it types in where to buy a dishwasher. Like that's just not just like a fun, you know, fun fact to know. You'd buy, you actually have, there's some intent there on where do I actually get this product or where do I buy a grill or something like that? So these are like really strong um, consumer behavior messages that tell us this person is in the market to buy. So once we know that they have already typed in this type of a search, um, we want to make sure that our ad shows up. But then on the flip side of that, we want to make sure that we're remarketing to them. And then we also want to make sure they're seeing us on social media too. So we want to make sure that in Facebook and Instagram, they continue to see our ads. Um, we're top of mind so that when they do finally get to the store, we're the first one that they think of. And in normal times, you know, outside of everything going on now, that in-store customer, that in-store visit is going to be our best customer because this is a much higher close rate than obviously an online sale. The average ticket price is higher. They're going to be more likely to buy the warranty. Um, we may be able to get them to buy the matching dryer or this dishwasher that goes with it, right? Because there's going to be a conversation that happens versus that online sale. So typically that is what we would want to do. We would want to drive more people into the store. Um, for, our, for our retailers that have a 
larger digital budget and there is an exact amount, Google actually tracks store visits as a conversion, which means that people that interact with our ads, we can actually see if they did come to the store. So Google is tracking them on their device, on their phone, so they can see they either clicked or viewed our ad and then they physically went to the retailer's location. So we're able to show that the ads that we're placing um, and that we're, the keywords we're bidding on are driving footsteps into the store, which is really exciting for us. Wow. And so, Jen, I know that there's so much going on with voice also, voice search. So Alexa and Siri. <clears throat> I was waiting for Alexa to say something. <laughs> She's right over there. <laughs> Tell her to play the podcast. Tell her to yeah, do it. She does, but she pronounced it. We need to talk about that because she doesn't understand dos, Marcos. She only understands dos. So I got to figure <laughs> out how to fix, fix her on that. But um, you know, so people can literally say, hey, you know, whatever, and then ask, hey, where can I get this? Um, is there any, any thought, do you have any thoughts on that and, and, and how can people connect to that? Because voice search is becoming bigger and bigger all the time. It is becoming bigger and bigger all the time. Um, and people are becoming more and more comfortable with it for our, for our specific industries. The biggest takeaway from, for us from search is just the, the fact that people are now starting to make their searches more conversational. So as we think about the keywords and the phrases that we're targeting, why we're targeting, what we're willing to bid on those, we want to think about how people are phrasing these questions and how they're asking them. Because once we can really identify those phrases and understand the, the intent behind that phrase, we can get better and better at bidding and we can get more effective at the ads that we show how we show them. Um, and what's fascinating in voice search and the fact that it's become so conversational is we almost want our ad text to be an answer to their question, right? Because the, the one that has that creates an ad text that's an answer to these conversational searches is the one that ultimately they'll click on because it looks like we're having a conversation already, even though you may not have come to the website yet. So it, they're getting better and better in terms of what they do and how customers can engage with them. But specific to our category categories, which are more high consideration purchases, we want to mine that data to find out what are people asking and what does it mean that they're asking it? And what's fascinating in terms of appliances and electronics is just kind of trying to understand what people know or understand in terms of our, our industry specific um, terms like, you know, column freezers and column refrigeration and things like, do customers know what that is? If we say French door or bottom mount freezer, do they understand that? So we sort of mine these terms and we're looking specifically for those voice searches to see what are they asking and how are they asking it so that we can answer that question. And voice search is gonna give you that information because you're saying, out of voice search, which is how they're now asking Alexa to go do something for them, they're typing it in that way as well. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yep. Or they might just be saying it in there, um, not specifically on the websites, but specifically in Google, they might just be using voice to to run that search. So we want to see what are they actually searching. It's fascinating. With something like that, when you can get into, you know, when you do a search audit and you get all these different terms that it spits out that are adjacent to your product category that you're trying to tackle. Um, how, how do you sift through that and prioritize that? Is that something where you're looking at like, like your top 10 or are you looking at budgets based on what those bids could be? How do you think about um, unraveling that rat's nest? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have this amazing um, report in Google, in our Google ads called search terms report. And what that means is we might bid on the keyword refrigerator, um, or French door refrigerator, let's say for example, but a customer actually searched for where to buy a refrigerator near me or where to buy a Samsung refrigerator, something along those lines, right? So we bid on the keyword, Google says, ah, this is close enough. That can also happen with, I might be bidding on the term um, appliance store near me, but a customer searches my name. Well, Google says, well, that really is a an appliance store near them, so we should show the ad because it's the same thing. They didn't actually say appliance store, they said the retailer's name, but Google says it's the same thing, so they show the ad. So the search terms report is not what we bid on, it's what the customer actually searched to see our ad. And so we mine that report for a lot of reasons. One, we mine it to find out if there's common terms we're seeing um, that are great to, to show intent and we hadn't thought of them. So we'll add that to the things, the list of things that we bid on. But more importantly, we use this to create what we call negative keywords. And that means we tell Google, 
if even though we're bidding on this search term that comes up, if somebody puts this into the search, I don't want our ad to show up. So an example of that is used appliances. So if I'm bidding on the key, uh, a term where to buy appliances near me, for example, and someone bids on, or someone searches used appliances, my ad might show up but I don't sell used appliances. So they may click on it, I paid for that click, and that's actually not a good customer for me. So we use that to find out, find ways that people are searching for us that maybe we hadn't thought of, but they're not really our best customer. So even like cheap appliances, for example, if we have a retailer who specializes in luxury kitchens or more high-end kitchens, then someone searching for cheap appliances isn't really their best customer. We don't wanna bid on that term. So we really use it to help narrow down what we bid on, how we bid on and how much we'll pay for that bid. So we ultimately want to find those terms that indicate the customer is either very low in the funnel or even if they're just in the research phase, we want our ads to show up because in the end, they're going to be a great customer for us. Wow, there's so much to get into here. And okay, so first of all, I want to hit the pause button for a moment and say, number one, uh, I'm a huge fan of Jen Danko. <laughs> um, I'm picking up so much, like so much <laughs> really cool information. And I love your combination of high level principle based information with some of the granular details that we need to be thinking about. Because when you get into this and you start quarterbacking, if you're a retail owner or a business leader, you start quarterbacking this, being able to speak the language helps and being able to understand the principles but also some of what's happening at the button pushing level, I think is really valuable. So thanks for, thanks for taking us through this in a way for me, that's been manageable. I have a, I have a reset question though. Yeah. And, and by the way, I think we're going to have to have you come back if you're game. Yeah. Um, any but, but here's, cause there's so much more I think to get to um, quick question though, put a blonde wig on Mark or I, who looks most like the tiger King? Oh man. That's really tough. I have to turn sideways. Maybe you can see the mullet in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that one. I don't know. Well, That's if, think if about it helps it. you at all, Kinsley usually <laughs> wears a six shooter strapped to his leg around the house every day. So I think it's an easier transition there, don't you, Jen? <laughs> Maybe next time you could break, have the mullet or something because it might help. A robe, the throne. Maybe you could do the throne. Well, where Quinn lives, it's not called a mullet. It's called the Missouri Compromise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you big Arkansas guy now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, b before we before we go, I have to say, Jen, you are awesome. And we've had a chance to get to know, know you a little bit at the primetime events. But... You know, Kinsley, just listening to Jen talk about the categories, right? Her knowledge and her team's knowledge about specific categories inside of what the, the retailers out there are selling, like how important that is, like to work with someone that really understands the products that are being sold, because that kind of information is really helpful in terms of knowing through experience what types of terms to buy, what types of terms to stay away from. So that was a really big takeaway for me, just how much value you can add to someone just because of your experience with that. Yeah, you know, that is so true. And I, I say that often too, because people don't realize just sort of the nuances of our specific categories. And I think our retailers in general, especially if they're just getting into digital marketing, there's this misconception that it's kind of like this black hole, right? And just sucks up a whole bunch of money and you hope there's a return for it. But the truth is we have so much data and insight and information into consumer trends and behaviors. But on the flip side of that, we also know which products for our retailers are the most profitable, um, which ones will you know, ultimately lead to maybe a package sale, things like that. I say this all the time to our retailers, like if we helped you sell a million dollars in microwaves this year, we didn't really kill it for you, right? Because there's, there's not a lot of profit in those. So we want to help you sell a million dollars in refrigeration or cooking products, you know, double ovens, those built in those high margin, high ticket items. Um, and so those are the ones that we want to focus on. But a normal agency who doesn't understand this category isn't going to know the difference between products. Not all sales are the same. We want those high profit sales. So just before we like fully wrap up to um, take us back and, and we're talking about a very unique um, world we live in at the moment. And we talked about e-commerce. We talked about live chat. Are those kind of the main focus areas that people might 
spend their time looking at in their business. I, I love that you said it's not too late to flip the switch on e-commerce. Yeah. Um, and then live chat being there for people whenever we're living in more of a virtual environment. Are those kind of where you would put your focus as a retailer right now? Yeah, so those would be the top two for sure that I would put my focus on. If they've already done that, if they've already implement, implemented live chat, um, they've already added their shopping cart, and then if they've already added inventory their, to their website, the next thing I would ask them to focus on is their social media presence. This is a great opportunity. People right now are shopping, or not shopping, but people online are communicating with friends and family through social media right now because we're social distancing, right? So they wanna know who's doing what, is everyone okay? So they're staying more connected than they ever have before on social media um, to make sure that they're, they know where everyone's at and what's going on, and then news channels as well too. But in social media, it's a great opportunity since more people are there to get their, their Facebook or their Instagram page page up to date, start putting in things like what kids, what like um, ideas that kids could do at home since the, many of the parents are homeschooling now, um, new recipes they can try since they can't go out as much as they did before. Um, so some new ways they can maybe try out some of those new appliances. But this is really important because when this is over, we want our retailers to be top of mind. And there's really a big push right now, even on social media, I think we've already all seen it about making sure we remember those local businesses. Well, they can't remember if you if they don't know you're there. So make sure that we're staying top of mind and making sure that our retailers are reminding their customers that they're in the community. These are not national chains. These are local companies that have served the community for many years. And we want them to remember that when this is passed and they can, and we're all back out again and, and we've all forgotten about social distancing, um, that these are retailers that have been there and been, been part of the community. Yeah, on our last episode, we even talked about what a lot of nationwide member retailers are doing. We talked about um, some businesses like, you know, we mentioned Trent, um, who is actually doing like, I just want to make one person smile every day. And yeah. also recognizing other local businesses that you can continue to support. Just doing things to stay top of mind, try to make people smile, try to lighten the mood, acknowledge the reality we're living in, of course. Uh, but you're right. I mean, on, on the backside of this, people are probably going to start shopping again. And yep. they're going to, like I said, have have had their entire palace under a microscope. That's and right. So, <laughs> so they're gonna they're gonna want to change some things, I think. And and when life will return to normal. And and we've lo I've loved uh, having you take us through some things we can be thinking about and be proactive with right now. Yep. And then I, I I see like Jen Danko like masterclass coming up next. Um, count me in. <laughs> it's gonna happen. All right. Before we go, I have a question yeah. for both of you. You ready? Yeah. So. There are couples that are spending a lot of time together now because people are quarantined at home. Now, Jen, your husband works with you at Sight on Time. And what is his title? Director of Web Services. And his name is Greg. Yep. So um, I'm, I'm sure he listens to the Galaxy's Greatest Mattress podcast all the time. Always. So we, we, so <laughs> we have to be careful how you answer. But That's um, <laughs> So the blog I'm writing today, you guys, is how do you coexist with your spouse? Because a lot of people like guys are going to work or the ladies are going to work. And now we're all spending more time together. So, Jen, I'm coming to you next, Kinsley. Piece of advice for everyone in my blog. Like, how do you navigate that to where you're not going to kill each other? OK, so like go like one one tip for everybody. Like, how do you just make sure that like works better? Yeah. So for us, and, and so we've, we've coexisted like this for a long time before this. So we have to create some, a little bit of separation and distance, even with our home. So, you know, he was working in a, a bedroom that's converted to an office right now that we wouldn't have done before, but just making sure we do have some separation and, and some ability to sort of, you know, think through things and, and stuff like that without being on top of each other all the time. For a little while, we were working at the kitchen table together when we were home and like, no, I found out I have and puff, he have some puffs, we make noises, we're like, <laughs> yeah. So, hey, I don't know. could we have some fun? Could you take your computer and go beat on the door and say it's time to get the damn trash out? Could you do that and just see what the reaction is? <laughs> he actually just went to the office to pick something up or I would. <laughs> oh, dang it. All right, Kinsley, hit us. What, what's I, the I, really, I really feel like Jen uh, and I have the same answer. We just create space that's yeah. your own. And I have, I have an office here and in my office, I have, you know, like yards upon yards of mattress ticking and I have, you know, foam and spring samples all over the place and a bunch of pillows and mattress protectors. And, um, 
all this different stuff around me, but this is kind of my work studio and it, and it really helps me to like be able to shut the door, kind of hole up and do my thing. Um, so that's been really helpful. And then it's just getting your mind right. And I talk to my wife about this a lot and talk to my friends and family about this a lot. Now to me is the time to get your mindset right and not wake up and wish this would have disappeared. Instead, make the choice that I'm going to be strong right now and say, good, good. I'm glad I have this time because now I get to do these things that I would have never gotten to do. And I think when you flip that switch and you get your mind right, it's going to put you in the driver's seat instead of putting you into into the anger seat or into the sadness seat. Um, I think we really need to think about what is your mindset right now and not be fake positive, but like really think about what that needs to look like, how you're going to be and adjust to the new reality, because we don't know how long it's going to be. And, um, you know, we have an old podcast with Michael Grossman from Kensington Furniture. And Michael told us about mindset being the first thing that he did to get his business right. Whenever four casinos closed in 90 days and basically sucked up all the money in the economy, he faced a very dire situation. And what did he do? He went to a Tony Robbins event. (laughs) <laughs> and he was sitting there at the Tony Robbins event, looking around saying, oh my gosh, I spent all this money. This, this is a mistake. Why did I do this? And in walked the guys from Ashley. I think it was Ron Wanick wow. who walked in. And Ron Wanick sat down right in front of him at this Tony Robbins event. And he actually got to talk to him. And they invest in the mindset. And that flows out to everything you do in business and life. And I'm not, And I really feel thankful that Um, I've spent some time there myself and I can extol the greatness of getting that part right. We don't know how long it's going to be. We need to get our minds right. We need to love each other. We need to be there for each other and we need to have our own spaces. Right, Jen? Wow. That was a way better answer than that. that, that, That's, I don't know. I think you both (laughs) nailed it. I think you're both wrong. I think it's day drinking. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know, you know, you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning, right? That's it. He is a little too happy over there, actually. <laughs> I heard some glug, glug, glug along the way it's today. It's hey, Jen Danko, Dos Marcos thinks you're awesome. Now, as far as a mattress industry podcast, it didn't suck, right? Not at all. No. Nope. Good. <laughs> Who's your favorite host? Darn it. Mark or Mark? <laughs> Mark or Mark? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to go with Mark. <laughs> Saved her. Good. We appreciate you being on, Jen. Thank you so much. Yeah. Tell Greg hi for us and uh, keep up all the good work with uh, what you're doing with the independent re- retailer. Um, it, it, it is the backbone of the country and we love who you are and, and your heart for what you do. And we're really grateful for the time. Thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you guys. We're going to go ahead and keep playing Michael Magnuson's song from goodbed.com written, performed by Mike Magnuson. Thank you again <laughs> for allowing us to roll out on this. <laughs> Well, not long ago, we were living our lives about as normal as can be. But then things got real, and now we're all home, perhaps indefinitely. You see, to stop the spread, we need to isolate ourselves from one another. But the good news is, that means a lot more time with your sister and your brother. Now the kids are home from school, which they think is kind of cool, except we're blowing up the internet. We're doing video meetings and virtual classes. Like, can you guys even tell me that? This is the new normal we are sheltered in place so we can save the population of the whole human race. Well, this is serious stuff to give ourselves the best chance we got to isolate. But that don't mean we can't dance. Now there comes a time when you gotta get out of the house to enjoy the day. So we go to the park and just make sure to keep other people far away And family time has never been better, at least in quantity Baking cookies in the kitchen, doing yoga in the yard, it's a parenting PhD And I'm my own bartender and that means that my glass is always full And the best part is that in this bar, pants are optional This is the new normal we are sheltered in place so we can save the population of the whole human race well this is serious stuff to give ourselves the best chance we got to isolate but that don't mean we can't
Well now we're cleaning the garage Cause this is number 82 on the honey-do list Next come the closets, the cupboards, the windows The painting, you get the gist Now people used to laugh that I hadn't watched all the shows everybody knows But now we got the time, so who's laughing now That I've been saving the Sopranos And if we get lonely and need to see Our friends and our family We just call them up on the video And talk about who has more TP Let's build a shelter, a shelter Ha 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 ha!